Hi, my name is Stuart Roberts, and I'm one of the founders of Pitt Street Research. And with me is Bob Pru, who is the CEO of Imagion Biosystems, based in San Diego, California. Bob, thanks for coming all this way. Morning. Welcome yeah. to be here. Good, good, good to have you. Um, now, Imagion went public on the ASX in 2016. 17. 17. 17. 17. Yeah. Tell us what you do. So Imagine Biosystems is developing a new non-radioactive, non-invasive way to detect cancer or other types of diseases. Right. It's a new form of medical imaging uh, specifically focused on the ability to do what's in, the, in this space known as functional imaging. Right. Uh, one of the problems we have with imaging technologies today is that uh, we can identify various types of tissue yep. or uh, diseased areas within tissue, but we can't tell you whether, for example, uh, in a mammogram, whether it's benign or malignant. Right. So they don't provide the functional aspect. They're able to identify areas of regions of interest, but not the functional aspect. We're trying to solve that problem. Imagine Biosystems MagSense technology is focused on the ability to um, be able to report back when, in fact, we know there is a specific type of cancer. Right. Now, um, you achieved that with, with a particular kind of uh, imaging technology called SQUID. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about the basics of the MagSense technology and, and why this is like tomorrow's technology rather than today's or yesterday. So the founder of the company had been working at Los Alamos National Laboratories in the area of, of uh, physics associated with uh, magnetic fields. Right. And so these SQUID detectors, um, which are ultra-sensitive magnetic sensors, right. Um, have the ability to d detect the fluctuations in magnetic field. Right. And he realized that if he could find a way to tag the diseased tissue with something that would report back a magnetic field, he could use these ultra-sensitive squid sensors um, to be able to detect that. Um, so he had been working using these squid sensors to map magnetic fields in the brain, for right, example. Right. And then realized that if I had a way to use that same squid sensor but tag the cancer with a magnetic property of some kind, right. he'd have a way to report the disease. So at right around that time was when we were really beginning to do a lot of work in the healthcare space with antibody drug conjugates yes. and finding a way finding ways to target um, delivery of drugs to tissue. Um, and the use of antibodies to be able to target binding of things, reporter molecules like fluorophores and that, to, to, to cells. And he realized that if I could combine an antibody with a magnetic particle and get it to attach to the tumor, I now have these ultra-sensitive squid detectors that could measure this magnetic particle. Right. So the particle then acts as sort of a magnetic beacon yes. where once it's attached to the tumor, it generates a magnetic signal that only these squid detectors can right, detect. Right. And okay, so so uh, a lot of people can can tag tumors with all sorts of things. But right. we're talking sensitivities hundreds, thousands of times orders of magnitude better than the CT scans. And and get. that's primarily driven by these ultra sensitive squid detectors. Right. So these squid detectors use a, a a kind of technology that today are used to measure magnetic fields in the in the upper atmosphere and in space. Yep. They are used actually in the mining industry to look for um, uh, changes and fluctuations in the magnetic field that might be associated with the different types of ores in the right, ground. Right. So these are super ultra sensitive. Yes. And so the ability to detect these tiny nanoparticles is predicated on this idea that these ultra sensitive detectors can measure the presence of these particles. And what's really interesting is that, of course, nothing else in the body is gonna generate a magnetic field right, like that, right. right? Tissue or bone don't generate a magnetic signature. Right. So the sensitivity of the detectors combined with the fact that these Ladies have sometimes particles, told me that I'm magnetic, but that's not what we're talking that's, about here, right? that's, yeah. that's a different kind of magnetism, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so the idea here now is you combine this reporter molecule, which is a, a, a safe iron oxide right, material right. that only generates a magnetic field when it's bound to the tumor right. with these ultra-sensitive detectors. Right. And so so you, you get rid of the, the radioactivity with traditional associated with dicot yeah. dicot dicot We're talking orders of magnitude safer. Yeah. And lower cost, right? I mean, and it's lower cost, cost. yeah. Right. So the, one of the problems today is CT and X-ray use, uh, you know, um, uh, radio... Uh, radio uh, isotopes right. and uh, activity to yeah. try to generate images of the tissue. PET scanners use a, a radio tracer of some kind. Right. And, and while generally, obviously, uh, from a regulatory perspective and an ethics perspective, it's they're being used at levels that are um, not ultra harmful to the patient, everybody knows that you don't really want to get exposed to radioactivity sure. if you can avoid it. Sure. And so, again, here, one of the things that's so attractive, we think, about the MagSense technology is it, it uses biologically harmless or, or safe types of, of materials in that. So the iron oxide that generates the magnetic field um, when attached to the tumor 
ultimately gets converted into ferritin, which is hemoglobin in your yes, blood. Yes, right? exactly, so yeah. all the materials are biologically safe that we put in there, and there's no need for any radioactivity for us to be able to report our result. Right, right. Now, this technology is so good, you recently were granted breakthrough device status. Yeah. Now, we're used for breakthrough therapy status for drugs. The devices are less well known, but this is a big deal. This like, is a big you know, deal right. from our perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, that um, a, a few years back, the FDA recognized that in the drug world, that you have orphan drug status and a few other ways that the, that the regulatory agencies were trying to stimulate uh, new, innovative approaches to uh, therapeutics. Right. Um, this, uh, on the device side of things, there wasn't a similar program. So they, they started looking at ways to try to help accelerate and improve innovative products in the device space. And so the Breakthrough Device uh, Program within the Center for Radiological Health at, uh, at the FDA was specifically designed to try to identify those technologies that they thought would be medical breakthroughs right. and help accelerate their path through the regulatory environment to try to get them into the marketplace. So in in June of this past year, uh, we applied to the FDA thinking that our technology would uh, would be qualify as a breakthrough device. We were very, uh, very happy to get a response from them, actually within three weeks. Right. I mean, uh, that's lightning speed. That's, by that, the way. Right. I, I think that that's pretty quick. Right. Uh, we, we had been interacting with the FDA for the, for the past year and a half already, so um, they were familiar with what we were trying to do. But um, we, we made, a, I think, a compelling case for why our technology should be considered as a breakthrough device and they agreed and designated it as such in July. All right, so let's talk about something many of the viewers would know about. Um, about 20% of all breast cancer in women is, is HER2 positive breast yeah. cancer. Now, the standard of care at the moment is, is uh, some kind of biopsy to, at the lymph nodes, which, right. which is, is, is painful and, and a little bit um, uh, tricky in terms of, the, right. of the, the surgeons. You've potentially simplified the whole process of diagnosing HER2 positive breast cancer, right? Well, so there's two parts to that. One right. is the original diagnosis of the of the primary tumor itself, and then, as you said, um, as an aspect of breast cancer care, they want to stage the uh, cancer. Stage, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, a little so for, right. first thing is, you know, you have to identify the primary tumor, and as as you correctly indicate, about 20% of breast cancer tumors are known as HER2 positive. Right. Um, HER2 positive tumors tend to be more aggressive um, and tend to uh, become metastatic right. uh, more frequently than other types of cancer. And so the concern frequently is when you have a patient who has a HER2 positive cancer, has it spread met, you know, metastatically? And the yeah. first place that you look is in the lymph nodes. Right. So staging post the first primary tumor identification is to identify whether or not the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes. Right. And we saw that as a real opportunity. Sure. Approximately 50% of patients are lymph node negative. Okay. But the standard of care, as you, as you correctly indicate, to determine that is some form of surgical biopsying procedure to try to identify whether the nodes are involved. Right. Well, if 50% of your patients are negative, but you had to undergo a surgical procedure to try to identify that, we're now doing surgeries and, and cutting lymph nodes, if you will, out yep. of patients yep. only to find well, out that, that it was negative. That's right. right? Yeah. So the doc gets to go back to the patient and say, good news, no metastatic spread. Bad news right. is I just cut your lymph nodes right. out. Right. Try to get you that answer. Right. We saw that as a tremendous opportunity to affect healthcare because if we could non-invasively determine node negative from node positive patients, we could, we could you know, avoid the lymphadenectomies for all those patients right. and the sort of concomitant morbidity that comes from having had your lymph nodes removed Absolutely. unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you're, um, you're getting ready to run a number of, uh, of pilot studies in, uh, at, at the moment, but uh, in the meantime, there's an interesting collaboration with a, a firm in Melbourne called Planet Innovation. Yes. They're, they're actually uh, getting you ready for the, for the device which will take the world by storm. Talk to us about that collaboration. Right, so, so the, the instrument the, that you were talking about, the squid-based instrument that we've been using, we developed in-house uh, using existing technologies. It works very well uh, for measuring in the preclinical setting uh, tissue samples and small animals to do the in vivo studies. Um, we've had one of our instruments at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas for about five years right. now working with them. Right. But that was designed as a prototype machine for doing research. Um, we, we realized that in order for us to get into the clinic and then also ultimately for commercialization, we needed a partner who really knew how to design and develop medical devices. Right. And so we, we did a classic search of uh, uh, and an RFP, request for proposal yeah. process, and, um, and been very pleased to be working now with Planet Innovation. They've got a stellar reputation as a medical device developer. And, um, and their job in working with us will be taking the existing squid basic technology and turning it into a version of a machine that can now measure 
in humans yes. uh, to do our clinical studies. Yeah. So that's the next major step forward for us is as we move to get into, into the clinic to do human-based studies is you know, working with Planet Innovation uh, alongside the development of our nanoparticle formulation to be able to, to do these studies now in human beings. Okay. Well, Prue, thank you for coming down to Australia and sharing uh, what you've got with Pitch Research. Pleasure. Appreciate yeah, the time. Good.